How do you feel great on vacation? Like really good? Easy. You go to Aruba. You'll spend your time relaxing on cool white sand beaches and floating in healing blue water. You'll immerse yourself in natural wonder and find your center on an island where things move at your speed. You won't just feel great. You'll feel relaxed, renewed, and ready for life. That's the Aruba effect. Plan your trip at aruba.com. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. How to get 30, 30, how to get 30, how to get 20, 20, 20, how to get 20, 20, how to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month? So Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. You're listening to Well Now, Slate's podcast on health and wellness. I'm Kavita Patel. And I'm Maya Feller. You know, Kavita, it's staggering to think that girls and women make up more than half the U.S., yet our health care isn't tailored to our unique needs as women. Yes, it's not just an enormous community, but everything from menstruation to menopause, the health statistics amongst this community are troubling. Let's take obesity, which we've spoken about on this pod. Over one in three women in the United States over the age of 20 are obese. And then let's talk high blood pressure. 45.7% of women aged 18 and older, so adult women, have hypertension. And then Maya, do not get me started on reproductive health barriers, where more women reported experiencing barriers to accessing reproductive health services in 2021 compared to four years earlier. And 18.6% of women in the U.S. experienced three or more reproductive health barriers in 2021 alone. At this point, Maya, inquiring minds want to know, what now? Oh, Kavita, I mean, this is just, these statistics, it, it's it's shocking. Like, I almost have nothing to say, but then at the same time, I'm enraged and have so much to say. You know, I was saddened, but not surprised to learn that the majority of research that informs healthcare, that includes, you know, the procedures and medications that are prescribed, have been conducted on men. I mean, men. Like, we know that both men and women have specific biological needs and processes. So why not? Why would we not center women in the conversation and research on women's health? I mean, Kavita, when I say that out loud, it seems so straightforward, yet it is not. It is like, I, I, it's infuriating and shocking to me all at once. It's a basket that I'm like, I kind of want to toss into the river. Kavita, tell me, tell me what you learned in med school. Like, what was your experience when you were studying all these texts? And what was it like for you when you were in med school? What did you learn? Things have changed over the last several decades, and there's certainly more attention to trying to understand whether there are differences in kind of the biology of how we take medication, how hormones might affect both, by the way, everything from testosterone to estrogen, which maybe people don't realize that women have testosterone and estrogen. It just comes in balanced levels. And I also think that it's surprising to many who say to me, well, wait a minute, there have been trials with no women in, enrolled in these clinical trials? And I say, yes. In fact, much of our existing literature prior to about 1990 really had very few women. And then from 1990 on, we have had a lack of what I would call kind of a representative sample of women. So they tend to be younger, healthier women, not necessarily reflective of what we were just talking about earlier, women of different sizes, women of different race and ethnicity and different kinds of socioeconomic status backgrounds, that doesn't even factor into it. So in med school, it was very much like all the women's things got shoved into my OBGYN rotation and then everything else you kind of treated completely equal. And it's only in the last, I would say, 10 years that now there's a little bit more of an acknowledgement that there's personalization. How about you? Are you hearing? I imagine like me, you have potentially a higher number of people who identify as women in your panel of patients, but what are you hearing from them? Is it true that like women tend to seek out 
you know, other care professionals that also share or perhaps understand what they're going through? And oh, what are they, absolutely. And what are they telling you when they come to see you? Like, what are their big areas that they're worried about? Yeah. I mean, Kavita, 100%. We have quite a few women that we take care of and that I take care of myself. It's so interesting. I can like in right now in this moment, I can think of the people that I saw last week, the patients, and so many of them have the same conversation. It's me saying, okay, I'd like you to go for follow up for X, Y, and Z reason. And then they say, oh, I'm looking for a new primary care provider, actually, so I, I can't go. I'm looking for a new uh, OBGYN. Uh, I can't go. Do you have a referral? Do you know someone that I can go to who specializes in women's health that will listen to me, that will take time with me? And then I say, okay. And I reach out to providers that I know in New York. And believe it or not, the list is so small. The same names keep coming up over and over again. And many of those people are full and they've got a long waiting list of a month, if not more. And the reason that they're so sought after is because they're personalized. They don't rush the patients. They actually have a real idea of women's health and the importance of women's health. And I find it so worrisome because I'm aware, Kavita, that like this routine care and follow up, it's not happening on an ideal schedule. And I want to be clear, these women that I'm talking about in my practice, they have insurance and they've got good insurance, right? So this is this is people who, who in theory are part of the safety net, right? They're not being left behind. Um, Kavita, what is your current experience now as an internist? So I can pick up the baton where you leave off because my patients are all in the safety net and have generally been left behind and the situation gets more dire. We know that for people, especially, for example, during COVID, and I, my patients reflected this, that they they deflected or deferred much of their routine screening. That happened, by the way, to men and women, but for women especially, uh, there was a statistically significant number of women that did not get their cervical cancer screenings or pap smears or breast cancer screenings, and we know this, colon cancer screening as well. So there, and I and I can't help but think as the person who runs our household that a lot of it had to do with, you know, when you're dealing with things like just trying to make sure you get your job done, trying to earn mm-hmm. a paycheck, trying to take care of a family, the last thing you think about is your own health. And we see that play out. And so I see a lot of this and it's worrisome. And I'll kind of use a moment of self-honesty that there are definitely times where I'm like, I could spend 20 more minutes on this, but I don't have it. And so I will send them to fill in the blank. I'll refer them out to an endocrinologist, to a dermatologist, to a sleep specialist, because my, sometimes it's just easier and the conversations we need to have, I hate to say it, they take time. They they can't be squeezed into 15 minutes. And they shouldn't be squeezed. You shouldn't have decades of kind of neglect of a of of you know half the world's population squeezed into 15 minutes, but that's what we're doing. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> no truer words have been spoken, my friend. That is exactly why conversations like this are so important. We really need to find a way to break the silence, and really create agency that allows women to say like, this is my information. And we want to let them, let really let ourselves know that we're not alone in this, right? And our guest today is going to help us do just that. Dr. Sharon Malone is a renowned expert in women's health. Called upon by both men and women around the world, including former First Lady Michelle Obama, for her insights. In her latest book, she gives a clear-eyed, no-nonsense look at all stages of reproductive life, including menopause, after this short break. Well, now, listeners, if you're enjoying the show and want to hear more, subscribe to our feed. New episodes come out every Wednesday morning. While you're there, check out our other episodes, too. 
like last week's with psychiatrist Dr. Dave Rabin. We talked about the exciting and often uphill battle in researching how psilocybin-assisted therapy can help to treat severe forms of depression and post-traumatic stress disorder, among other mental illnesses. Check it out. Americans take about 20,000 breaths a day and spend an average of 90% of their time indoors. The indoor air we breathe can be up to 100 times more polluted than outdoor air, according to the EPA. Indoor air pollutants can cause respiratory symptoms like sneezing, congestion, scratchy throat, and even more serious health problems like lung and heart disease. So what's the solution? Introducing Air Doctor the air purifier that filters out 99.99% of dangerous contaminants so your lungs don't have to. This includes allergens, pollen, pet dander, dust mites, mold spores, and even bacteria and viruses. Air Doctor comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if you don't love it, just send it back for a refund, minus shipping. Head to airdoctorpro.com and use promo code WELLNOW and you'll receive up to $300 off air purifiers. Exclusive to podcast customers, you'll also receive a free three-year warranty on any unit, which is an additional $84 value. Lock in this special offer by going to A-I-R-D-O-C-T-O-R-P-R-O.com and use promo code WELLNOW. I had been looking forward to trying to find a convenient way to learn a new language, in my case, French, as I'm headed to Paris, France, and taking on all that the Olympics have to offer in 2024, when I came across Babbel. I'm really excited to try Babbel for a couple of different reasons. One, there's science behind the language learning app. Two, there are even quick 10-minute lessons. You don't have to pour through hours and hours of trying to decipher what part of this new language do I need for conversations, what is really just more academic. And then I really didn't want to waste a lot of time on hours of trying to search through private tutors or trying to find another way to learn something when I could have a tip or tool in my pocket. Plus, all the other languages that are available on Babbel, you can learn Spanish, French, German, Italian, Turkish, and many more. Here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash wellnow. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash wellnow, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash wellnow. Rules and restrictions may apply. Welcome back. You're listening to Well Now. I'm Kavita Patel. And I'm Maya Feller. Today, we're talking about women's health and why there is still not enough research, study, and attention on the health issues that matter to us women and women at large as we age. Our guest today is Dr. Sharon Malone. She is a board-certified OBGYN with over 30 years of experience and the chief medical advisor at Alloy Women's Health. Her new best-selling book that I read, I mean, actually, I devoured, Grown Woman Talk, Your Guide to Getting and Staying Healthy, which provides practical advice for women navigating aging and the healthcare system. Dr. Sharon, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, Maya. And I love you already. Okay. So, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I'll take it. I'll take it. I love you back. (laughs) Okay. So Dr. Sharon, we like to start off our show by asking our guests how they think about quantify and define wellness. Well, you know, that is both an easy question and a hard question. And I think wellness is defined when you are feeling your best self. And that is you are not bothered by aches and pains and physical or emotional pain. And I think that whenever you can get in that space and, um, Kavita, you know that there is a sense called interoception that none of us really tune into, but that is just the sense, the internal sense that you have when your body is in sync. You are not aware of any other body part and that's how you're supposed to feel. That's where you are when you are well, when you are not bothered by that. So whatever you need to do to get to that space and to maintain that space, that's where we're trying to go. Wow, Maya, I, I can tell you right now, I'm, I'm starting to do a self-assessment. I'm not sure I'm in sync. I don't know about you, but I'm very eager, Dr. Sharon, to 
kind of get right into it because I too, not just devoured the book, but also found it just refreshing because it just gave us like an insight into so many issues that women face as we age with also your just very personal kind of experience behind it. But what motivated you to write it? And, and I know that this was a labor of love. So what do you hope people take away from it? It really was a labor of love. And I have to tell you, I know that you know what this is like when you're the only doctor in your friend group and you're the only doctor in your family. And I spend as much time navigating and negotiating healthcare for my family and friends almost as I did for my patients who actually would come to see me. And the one thing that really struck me again and again and again is how little people understand how to negotiate this system. It's confusing. It's Byzantine to say, you know, at its best. And people just don't realize what it takes to be a good advocate for yourself. And if you don't have someone on speed dial that you can say, well, okay, figure this out for me. What are the things you should know? So this is sort of the the reason I wrote the book and why it was called really Grown Woman Talk, because yes, there's menopause in it, but it's not just about menopause. It's about a lot of other things that you may encounter in midlife. But I wanted to also center the experience. I didn't want to write a book like a, a textbook, you know, uh, describing various ailments and illnesses. I wanted to really center the experience as me, not just me, the doctor, but me as the sister, as the friend, as the daughter, and to try to give the kind of good advice that I would want all of those people who really mean so much to me, I would want them to have. So that is really how the book came about. After 30 years of practicing medicine, and when I left, I kind of felt like, am I done? Well, perhaps not. I've may have another thing or two in me before I go. And that was really what led me to the book. And I feel like I still have a little bit of something to say, and I hope it's useful. I think that it's incredibly useful. And I mean, truthfully, when I picked up the book, I was, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 pages in. My stepmother was visiting from out of town. And I actually said, I have a book that I recommend for you. I recommend this book for everyone in the family. And I think that we should just be passing it around. So I think the way that it's written is so approachable and it's clear that it's a mix of your experience and your desire to really leave a roadmap for folks. So you've had this really long and distinguished career in obstetrics and gynecology. What are some of the most significant changes that you have seen in the field over the years? You know, I think one of the more distressing changes that I've seen is that we realize that medicine has become less and less personal, you know, and I had the great good fortune of being in one practice in one city for almost 30 years. And that gave me a really a unique vantage point because there are literally patients that I have that I have known since they were in high school and I've known them through high school, college, They've had their children and they're going through perimenopause, all of that in one fell swoop. I knew their mothers. I'd take care of their children. I mean, that kind of intergenerational care and being able to sit still and being one place as a physician and as a patient, that's just not going to be the lived experience for most people moving forward. You know, we are at one of those inflection points in medicine where Everything is changing, but no one really told you what the changes are. And we are dealing with the fact that most doctors are not able to maintain independent practices. So that means as a young physician, particularly, you're going to work for someone. You're either going to work for a hospital group or a private equity group is going to come in and buy up your practice and become these huge super groups. And that doesn't really lead to the sense of stability, because if it's not your practice as a physician, you may not be as wedded to that particular practice. You may move around. And then when you couple that with the fact that people's insurance changes, you know, you can stay in the same job and your employer will change insurance. And then you have to go create an entirely different medical team for yourself. So given all of those changes that are going on in the background, the one common thread through all of it is you. 
because you might have to go explain this story to a new doctor or a new nurse practitioner or in a new city even. And no one is going to know you better than you. So these are all the things and tips that I want you to have because I want women to understand that I'm not belly aching about it. It's what it is. You know, it's, it's where we are. But if you knew that, I think that you would understand the power you have and you would also understand the things that you are responsible for because that old model of, oh, my doctor's just going to take care of me, not so much. And that's not to say you're going to get bad care. You're going to get different care. So just know what that difference is. Yeah, Dr. Sharon, this is a huge, I think, important point for listeners to kind of underscore bold, try to remember that it's you. I I think for so long, and I've seen you do it, I've witnessed you doing this over the years and kind of taking people through significant milestones in life, you know, birth of their children, their children having children, just this incredible like gift to be able to do that. But that is absolutely the rarity. And so you in the book also talk about breaking the cycle of the triple threat. Tell our listeners how you define the triple threat and why it's so important. You know what, when we talk about triple threat, and this is something that I think that as we are entering midlife, this is when we really get to the point where we're talking about cardiovascular disease sort of rears its ugly head you know? And when you talk about that, you're really talking about hypertension, diabetes, obesity, you know, the things that tend to creep in right around the middle that will rob you of your health more than smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. And these are things that we do have control over. We want to make sure that you know that just because you have a family history of heart disease or diabetes or even parents on dialysis, that does not have to be your reality. And this is where I think the earlier you get this message, the more control you have over avoiding that fate. So I preach a message of really prevention about how to make sure that even if you can't avoid some of the things that will be coming down the road, you can at least push them off farther in the future. And that's where, you know, when we talk about the things that we worry so much about cancer, and as women, we worry, I think, excessively so about breast cancer, but for reasons that, and maybe, you know, you you can tell me this, but why we are not as concerned about our cardiovascular health as we are about, you know, getting our mammograms. And we should do that. Let's make that clear. That's important. But when are we going to refocus that, you know, that whole thought process about how we age and how we want to age well and healthfully? I mean, that's why I spend the time talking about the things that will rob you of not only of your life, but the quality of your life as you age. Yeah, Dr. Sharon, I feel like both can be true, right? This conversation of really understanding that, yes, we need the annual mammograms. And at the same time, just as you said, when we're thinking about what's going to actually rob us of our health and functionality, that we have to be amply aware of that and take steps, just as you said, to say like, okay, well, what are the things that we can do? And I think that that's a conversation for me that is so new to hear that both can exist together. So I want to switch gears a little bit. I mean, it's not a total gear switch, but I'm interested in hearing from you how mental health plays a role in overall health and well-being and also how women can really be aware and ensure that they're taking care of their mental health. Well, you know what? None of these things can really be discussed in isolation because let me just say, and again, as we're talking about as we enter midlife and midlife for people, you know, I often hear patients will say they'll be 60 years old and then, yeah, and I'm middle-aged. I'm like, Girl, you are way beyond middle age. <laughs> I, hate to, I hate to break that to you. You're in my category now. But middle age starts at 40 people. So I don't want people to think, oh, well, that's just for old people. No, I'm talking to you 40-somethings and even some of you 30-somethings. Um, because let me just say, let's take, for instance, let's take 
any one of these things that really sort of spikes in midlife. Depression, anxiety, all of the mood disorders that that really take off right around the time that women are entering midlife. Okay. So depression goes up, irritability goes up, and anxiety disorders go up tremendously. Well, what else happens to you when you're anxious and depressed? There's also the problem with chronic stress, you know? Um, And if you don't, the reason why you can't take them one at a time is because yes, some of it's hormonal. There is a spike that happens when women are entering that midlife or perimenopausal phase, but some of it is also situational because if because of your hormonal or perimenopausal issues, now you're having hot flashes, now you can't sleep, now you have brain fog, you wake up the next day, you've got to go do your job. Well, guess what? You're not in a good mood. And you know, Dr. Patel, you and I both know that after a night of being up all night and you've got to go to work the next day, you are not your best self, nor are you in your best mood. So all of this stuff really contributes to, again, this, I would say, decrease in the quality of your life. And that's why they must be addressed. But chronic stress is huge. Now, we don't get to choose what things in life that are going to befall us. We do not. You know, sometimes life is stressful. Yes, it is. It's particularly stressful for those of us well, I should say not those of us, I'm beyond midlife. I'm on the back nine, you know, but for those of you young people who are really, you know, coming into your forties, it's a stressful time of life. Many of you have, you have children at home, you have aging parents to deal with, and you are still trying to navigate what's going on at work. So there's that. But here's what the message that I really want to give is that if you have any one of those things, anxiety, depression, irritability, chronic stress, figure out a way to deal with it. And sometimes the answer is that, you know, you're perimenopausal and you need hormones so you can get a good night's sleep. The first and reflexive answer shouldn't always be antidepressants, because I think that particularly if you're in midlife, you treat the midlife thing first, which is perimenopause. Then if you have other issues, then you can figure out because, and this is also some important research is that even if you have a diagnosis of depression during midlife in this perimenopausal transition, taking, you know, the ability to take hormone therapy, it actually acts synergistically with an antidepressant. So, you know, you'll do better with both than with either of them alone if there really is a mood disorder. And when we're talking about dealing with chronic stress, we're talking about making sure you're, again, getting a good night's sleep, you're exercising, you're eating a healthy diet. These are all just lifestyle things that the earlier you implement them, the better you're going to come out on the other end of it, regardless of what outcome we're looking at, be it cardiovascular disease, be it cancer, be it Alzheimer's disease, All of these things, you know, so that's why I said when we start pulling at a thread, you realize that it's a thread that is woven through all of these things, not just one. Mm -hmm. And these are the conversations, truthfully, that I know Kavita and I have spoken. I wasn't hearing this when I was 20, much less 30. And, And this is so new to me. I was actually really struck in the book you wrote. And I I felt like you were talking directly to me, Dr. Sharon. You wrote, if you have a doctor and they have their practice still, that's my case, and you've seen the same person for years, same doctor since I was 17, and they have graying hair, it is time to begin looking for a new provider. I dropped the book. I was like, oh my goodness. I mean, but these are the truths that we just don't here as we're moving through life as women. Right. And let me just say, I have a lot of gray hair. So, you know, you could have stayed with me as long as I'm there. But here's the problem. If you see a doctor that's that age, they're not going to be around that much longer. That's the reality of it. And that, you know, there is, um, and Kavita, you know, I, I keep coming back to you because we listened to you so much during COVID and explaining, you know, what was going on and you know what the stress and burnout is for physicians. And that's real. 
And let me just say this, because I look at, uh, I look at young people coming out and I'm go, oh my goodness, you know, I'm not sure, you know, if I were entering the marketplace right now, that this would be something that I'd be jumping up and down to do because it's hard. And I think it's hard and it's taken away when you don't have personal relationships with your patients. It takes away some of the joy of the job. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, I absolutely loved watching people grow up, grow old, you know, looking at their families, bringing their kids in to see me. I love that. And if you don't have that kind of relationship, then it makes it a job. You know, you're just, you're coming in, you're doing your work. And you again, you're not doing a bad job. You're just, it takes the joy. It takes some of the joy out of the experience. Would you agree? Oh yeah, absolutely. And you can tell there have been days where I'm like, I am not coming here with my best self. So we need to pause and we'll do this today. And then I'll have you come back next week because I know you need more than I can give you today. And that conversation is raw and honest, but not enough of us have it. We're going to take a break here. And when we come back, we'll hear more from Dr. Sharon Malone on her journey to changing care for millions of American women as well as biggest tips on how to navigate and advocate for your own reproductive care. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. How to get 30, 30, how to get 30, how to get 20, 20, 20, how to get 20, 20, how to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month? So, Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. You're listening to Well Now from Slate. I'm Maya Feller. And I'm Kavita Patel. And we're continuing our conversation about women's health with Dr. Sharon Malone, author of the New York Times bestselling book, Grown Woman Talk, Your Guide to Getting and Staying Healthy. All right, Dr. Sharon, let's talk a little bit more about you. I felt like I've always kind of known you, uh, just having practiced in and around and sharing patients with you. I loved reading about your sister, Vivian Malone Jones, who was one of the first African-American students to enroll at the University of Alabama. How did her experiences influence your path, your kind of ideals and commitment to social justice? You know, I grew up in a household and I'm from Mobile, Alabama, and I grew up and believe it or not, it's not the rural South. It was actually a city. It's a big, well, you know, for Alabama, it's a big city. Um, But my parents were from the rurals, you know, they were from farmlands and moved to Mobile when they were, my dad was 50 you know, the first time he had ever lived off the farm. But I think what was very motivating for all of us is that even though they had no reason to believe that things were going to get better, they did. And that was how we were raised. That's how Vivian, you know, after generations, and I'm a sixth generation Alabamian, and never had my parents and none of my siblings had ever been to an integrated school. And for the first time ever, my sister, you know, decides she's going to go to the University of Alabama. And you have to have a certain degree of self-esteem and self-confidence to be able to do that. And that is where I think that um, the lessons of my parents really came in. We were never taught or believed that we were ever less than Um, And you had to get out there in the world. And they also knew that education was the best vehicle for being able to change your lot in life. So, you know, I think about that. I was just, you know, I was four years old when Vivian went to the University of Alabama. So I know all of it through, you know, the footage and the George Wallace standing in the door. And I know those stories very well. And I remember when she graduated and it didn't really hit me until I was the mother of daughters who were the age that Vivian was when she went to the University of Alabama. And I thought to myself, oh my God, 
what were my parents thinking? You know, how could you just let your daughter walk in? It's like me sending my Maya to the University of Afghanistan. Good luck. <laughs> Hope it turns out for you. You know, I, I mean, that was literally, you know, she was walking into the maw. I mean, this was 1963. So mm -hmm. everything bad that you've ever seen about Alabama happened in 1963. And that was how she went to school. And 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 my heart really breaks for her because I know what college is supposed to be like. And I know her college experience was not that. Um, but she managed to persevere. And I think that it gets back to what we were talking about earlier, because I tell her story because it's about stress and about chronic stress and what stress does to you. It wears you down physically, emotionally, mentally. But here's the thing about African-American women. It's so much a part of who we are that we don't even register that stress is stress when we're under stress. You just keep going, putting one foot in front of the other, doing what you do. But the reality is, is that, as I said, the body takes a toll and you pay for that. And so that's why I said, you know, not acknowledging what stress does to you, what stress does to your immune system, what stress does to your blood pressure, all of that, which adversely affects your health. That's the problem. Like I said, the stress is the stress but let's figure out a way that we can manage it or a way to be able to at least control our reactions to the stress, even if we can't control the stressors themselves. You wrote beautifully. You have some very, I think, important lessons about kind of why we have to be better advocates for ourselves, especially in the current medical system. You gave some, you just cited some reasons, Dr. Sharon. It's everything from probably not going to have a lot like a doctor who knows you very well. You might have different doctors changing them, specialists. What do you think is one of the more important barriers that put women at a disadvantage in kind of getting and advocating for themselves? I even see it when I'm a patient, you know, you're just kind of helpless. It sometimes feels like, well, why, why is this happening and why does it continue? Well, cause one, I think a lot of us in that situation, we're intimidated because there's certain a power imbalance when you go in and you're talking to the doctor and you think that they know something that you don't know. And then you're nervous. And particularly when there's something wrong, you know, when you've got to discuss hard things or, you know, illnesses, or you're not feeling well, you are not, a lot of times you're just not thinking clearly and you don't really know how to advocate for yourself because you feel like you're being rude or, I don't want to contradict the doctor and the doctor says, and, and that whole thing has really, we sometimes swing too far in the other direction because I'm sure you know this too, because you will have patients that come in and they Googled it last night and they figured, I'm, I'm like, okay, I, I know you Googled it, but, but I do know a little bit more than you do with your 15 minutes of research. <laughs> however, however, the more you know, and I think the more you know, you don't have to know the answer as a patient. That's not the point. The point is how to know when to ask the next question, you know, how to just even be able to say to yourself, okay, please explain to me. I, I, I was never of the, the mind as a doctor that when I asked a patient to do something, this is how I felt about it. It's like, we're a team. We're on the same team. I want you to be better. You want to be better. So let's figure out how this is going to work. And I think if you want to enlist people to be on your team, the team, let's get better, then explain to them why you're doing it. You know, don't say do this, do that. Bye. See you next week. You know, no. If you really engage patients and you understand, they understand why you're doing what you're doing. And it's not at all problematic when patients ask me, well, why are we doing that? At least explain your thought process. I may be right, I may be wrong, but at least you know what I'm thinking. And I think that so many of us, that's why it's, it's, it's easier to be non-compliant when you don't understand the importance of what I just asked you to do. So that's the kind of conversation and advocacy I want you to do for yourself. I don't want you to go pour over anything. And, and, you know, I just want you to be able to ask good questions 
and to make sure that whoever you're talking to is making it make sense to you. That's all. And listening to your gut too. I mean, all of those moments, Dr. Sharon, you, you know, people know, you can even see it in patients' eyes, you know, that this is not working, it's not resonating, or you can tell that they don't really, you haven't spent enough time. And I hate to say it, this is another one of those factors. It takes time to do this. So you, you can tell, and, and I often kind of say, I, I do this with my kids, like, okay, we need a reset. Like it, this is, you know, I am not communicating effectively and I am not listening, or I need you to tell me more because I can tell you're holding something back. And, and, and that, right, you know, right. the, yeah, it, it happens a lot. I'm sure it happens to you too, Maya. Oh yeah. One of the things that sometimes I will say to my patients is tell me what you understand. The, uh, mm-hmm. Like, what did I say? What, how does that resonate with you? What have I said to you and how does it resonate along those lines to actually get the people to speak it back? Because it is this thing. You're right. Folks clam up, myself included. I mean, I feel like I was at the doctor the other day and I, I count myself articulate. And I think of myself as having some, you know, fairly good health literacy. And I left and there was a question I totally forgot to ask, like completely forgot to ask. And actually, Dr. Sharon, this is something that you note in the book around becoming a really good storyteller, right? Like what are the things that are important for you, the patient to share with your provider? And like, how do you gather this essential information so that you can really have this positive healthcare journey. As I was reading, it really got me to thinking a lot about like history and the history of silence within Black communities throughout the diaspora and particularly among women. And I, I, I wondered, you know, why do you think that's been the case for so long, this history of silence? Well, you know, I think it's it goes back to that same concept of sort of learned helplessness, you know. Um, you were silent because who were you going to tell, you know. I think that when you complain because you think that someone is going to answer or address your complaints or issues. And I think for so many people, and certainly for my parents, they grew up in rural Alabama, there was no doctor to talk to. There and so and and talk about the power imbalance. Imagine you're in the rural, segregated South, and doctors are all white, and you know, and you've got to figure out how to get that. And people engage too late, you know, with medical care. Um, and so I think that that silence came from, you know, it was a a, a trait that developed because. It, you, nobody asked you, you know what I mean? Nobody was paying any attention to you, whatever. So it's like, what's the point of having a conversation with nobody's going to fix it? There's that. And I think that we, particularly as women, somehow we think that there's some badge of honor about suffering in silence. You know, this is where the strong black woman trope comes in. The fact that you can just take anything and, you know, take a licking and keep ticking. You know, I mean, that is somehow a badge of honor. You know, how much can we take on? How much of our children's stuff can we take? How much of our parents' stuff can we take? And I think that what I want women to do is to say, you know, yeah, there's some of that. But at the end of the day, you've got to figure out there's a time that you need to put yourself first because, you know, you're going to be in no position to take care of anyone else if you don't take care of yourself. And so that's sort of the message. And I, I hope that it comes through in the book about the empowerment piece of it, because, you know, I want you, I want everybody. I don't want the expectation or that when we're telling our story, I don't want the narrative to be that it all ends in, with debility and disease. You know, I want to say, no, I want to be good until I'm not. And I don't, you know, having that long period of decline. And that's the thing about women that we don't realize that and certainly the general pub- public doesn't realize this is that, you know, for all the things that we think, well, women live longer than men. Yeah, but we don't, we live less healthfully. Mm-hmm. We spend a lot of the time of our elder years in care. And if anyone who doesn't believe me, walk into any nursing home anywhere in any city and see who's in there. That's right. That's exactly right. So 
That's why I said we've got to craft another story, but to craft another story means that you have to imagine a different ending. And if we're going to imagine a different ending, then there's some things you need to do along the way to make sure that you don't end up there. And don't accept that as the inevitability of where we all end up. No, we can do better. We Mm -hmm. can be better. At any point that you enter this story, you do have the ability to change it, even just a little bit. I think that's incredibly important. I know that we just were talking about people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. It's never too late to even start making that kind of minute change, like something that just, you know, I've, I've had a army and kind of, you know, per- people in service who have said like, you know, if you're, if you're in a certain direction, you make one degree of adjustment on that compass takes you in a very different pathway and, and you can choose that pathway. You can make that change. And so maybe we can use this to talk about kind of what you described. I love so many of the pearls of wisdom here and you call it the marvelous fourth quarter, uh, the kind of time in, in which I think you've included yourself, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, beyond. Give us some of those pearls for women in like that fourth quarter and how great it can be, but how you can take care of yourself, what we should be doing to take better care of ourselves. Absolutely. And let me say, because I really want to, you know, and I'm not just saying this just to say it, I'm 65 years old. I am probably certainly as happy now as I have been at any point in my life. You know, you spend, you know, you think about all those high school years and the tumult of college (laughs) and some of that was fun. But then, you know, we've had, and then it's, let's just say child bearing and rearing, you know, some of it's fun, but you know. We are in the thick of it. Kavita and I are in the thick of it. We are. (laughs) I know it's some long, long, long days you'll have. Very long. You know, so for those of us who are entering this phase of our lives and it's menopause and beyond, it's really the first time that you get to just say, you know what? That's why, why do you think old women just get to say whatever they want to say? Because it's like, I am so tired of bending and trying to make everybody else happy. Do you like this? No, I don't. You look ridiculous. You say whatever you want to say. So that's freeing. That's freeing. So you get this opportunity that, you know, kids are out of the house, you know, whatever it is with your partner, it either is or it isn't, but it's baked, whatever that happens to be. And even if you're alone, that being alone is also a choice because there's so much about community. And I, let me just say this, I love the community of women. That is where, when I say I get my sustenance and I love my husband, we're good, but, you know, in terms of, of community And where can I consistently go to and get joy and have my spirit fed? It's really in community. It's my friends. It's the people that I choose to be around with. It may or may not be your family. Okay, let's be clear about that. You know, sometimes if it's family, that's fantastic. But sometimes family causes you more stress than, you know, than need be. So figure out where it is you find your joy but always do that in community. And I think that, again, just the staying vibrant, exercising, doing it with people that you like, doing things with people that you like, all important for it. Not only, again, your long-term physical health and your long-term mental health. Even, you know, they even think that having friends and community is even one of the things that staves off the ravages of Alzheimer's. You know, it's just having community. Nothing is worse than social isolation as you age. Yeah, we've we've talked about that. And I love that idea of, you know, kind of closing on this marvelous moment in women's lives. If there were some, you know, things that you wanted people to leave with as we close out and think about like for the future, Right. And it can be in any of the decades of life. But like, what are some of the through lines that come to mind for you? The through line is really prevention, because I want us to change the mindset that things, you know, your family history is important. Yes, it is. But your family history just sort of gives you what you are predisposed to, not what you are destined to. So great. That's a a road marker that says, okay, let's not go that way. That's what your family history does. And I think that, you know, when you put 
change that mindset about this is what aging looks like, or this is what my family history is. It gives you all the power in the world to utilize the tools and tips that I talk about, like healthy diet, good night's sleep, don't smoke, control your blood pressure, exercise, all of those things. If you start implementing those, the younger you are, I mean, then I think that we have, we have not just changed it one degree. My God, we can change that 180 degrees from the direction that you may be headed in. And that's the message. That's the good news. That's the good news about this is that we have way more control and way more power over how we age than we ever thought. And it doesn't necessarily involve waiting on someone to come up with a new medication. This is all stuff you've got in your hands right now. That's pretty powerful right there. Um, I know Kavita and I will take it to heart and I'm sure that our listeners will as well. You know what? I want to say one thing before I go. And that is, you know, we talked about a lot of heavy stuff, but you know, the book is not all heavy. No. I hope, yeah, I hope that people don't think, oh my God, it's gloom and doom. No, it's not. And I even have a playlist. I love music. So, you know, it's one of those things where if I, you know, I would, I'm a closet DJ. So there are a lot of musical references throughout the book. And there's even a playlist. You can go to Apple Music or Spotify and go to Grown Woman Talk Book. And all of the musical references and playlists that I include at the end of each chapter, you can go listen to them. So if something gets a little bit too heavy for you, just stop, put it down, go listen to some music, come back. I love that. I love that, Dr. Sharon. <laughs> I'm on Spotify as we speak. I'm addicted to Oh, here it is. Grown woman. To, oh, workout. Re, this is great. Look at this. I love it. You've got good taste. This is nice. All right. We won't play that music uh, to, to disrupt our great audio, but you're right. Actually, the, the tone reading the book, I, I wish my daughter were not seven. Maya, you should give this to your daughter. She's still a little too young. I feel like our daughters are just on the, they're too young, but I want them to read parts of it because there's I parts agree. of it that I think are, that Dr. Sharon, that's your next job. Take it, take parts of this and, uh, you know, adapt it for kind of the, uh, I guess we'll call it the marvelous first and second quarter, but. Oh, you know what? Or oh, we'll call it future grown, future women. grown, women. future grown women. There you go. Because yes. it is positive and it is hopeful <laughs> and it is something that people should get, get it, give it, hold on to it for the, uh, any special occasion, holiday season. It makes a great gift for anybody. My husband saw me reading it and he recognizes because when he was coming to all those visits at at uh, your former practice, occasionally you'd kind of pop in and out to get people from the waiting room. And he's like, wait a minute. Oh, she has a book. And so he picked it up and he's like, oh, this is pretty good. So <laughs> it's, it, it has mass appeal. <laughs> it has so much mass appeal. Dr. Sharon, you know, I do have to say when I think about like the future and the future grown women, I think what this book for sure has really given me agency around is the idea that my genes are predictive, but not my destiny. Mm. And I have the possibility to work with my daughter as well as my son to make shifts now, yeah. even though she's 11, but there's like a huge possibility. And I think as a black woman in the US, you're right. I hear so much doom and gloom and you hear it too, Kavita, right? Mm -hmm. So this is like, for me, oh, wow, this is a moment of sunshine because guess what? There are things that I can do. And that is a new narrative. Absolutely. And you know what? I thought about it when I wrote the book. I said, you know, you know that book, What to Expect When You're Expecting? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, this is what to expect if you expect to live beyond 40. I love it. I, I, I could just see the writing, the whiteboard with the, all the titles and save those titles for the next edition and the next book. It's like, I love it. Dr. Sharon Malone is a physician and best-selling author of Grown Women Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. That's our show this week. Well Now is edited and produced by Vic Whitley-Berry. Ben Richmond is Slate's Senior Director of Podcast Operations. Alicia Montgomery is Vice President of Audio. We'd love to hear from you email us at wellnow@slate.com. If you want to support this show, please consider becoming a Slate Plus member. 
you'll get to listen to this show ad-free, as well as hear bonus material from some of your other favorite Slate podcasts, like Slow Burn and Amicus. You'll also have full access to all articles on Slate's website. And be sure to tune in next Wednesday as we tackle another part of the wellness industry. I'm Maya Feller. And I'm Kavita Patel. Thanks for listening.